Well, hello there. Welcome back to another episode of the Midweek Refill. I am your host, Bishop A. Reginald Littman, and I'm so excited to share with you in this brand new year. You know, we took a couple of weeks to just kind of regroup and catch up on some things, and we're back now continuing our series on Lessons from the Twelve Disciples. And this week, we're in part seven, and we're talking about Matthew the tax collector. So do me a favor, like, share, subscribe, hit the thumbs up button, hit the like buttons, throw in some emojis. All of this activity helps this study to get out and to spread out across the world. And it helps other people to find it. And if you find valuable content from these studies, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Well, again, welcome back and happy new year to you. So we're looking at part seven, Matthew, the tax collector. What an interesting life and story. In fact, all of the disciples' lives have been very interesting, and we've been able to gain so much and glean so much from their lives and their walk with Jesus Christ. And it should inspire each and every one of us to have an even more closer and personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ as one of his disciples so that as other people look at our lives, they'll begin to see how Christ has manifested in us and through us and all around us. So this is a great series and I hope and pray that you're getting a lot out of it just as much as I enjoy actually bringing it to you. So let's jump into this week's study on Matthew, the tax collector. So to begin with, we know that Matthew, also named Levi, was a tax collector. Now, that role in particular was a role that was often despised in their culture. Matthew's story, of course, is a testament to the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. And it is a reminder that no matter what line of work we're in or what... what uh, areas we struggle with, or maybe even our habits or routines or those kinds of things, that walking with Jesus is a life-changing experience. So Matthew exemplified for us great faith, even great leadership, and his story is one of great redemption. Of course, Matthew, as I stated earlier, was a tax collector, so he's a businessman, uh, very astute as it related to uh, tabulating coins, money, keeping up with facts and figures. But also there's a very negative connotation that would be associated with being a tax collector. Because as a tax collector, Matthew, along with all of the others, was seen as a traitor and even as a sinner by the church for collecting taxes for the Roman Empire. You must remember that Rome uh, was very heavy-handed in ruling and in demanding of people, even innocent good people, hardworking people. And so the tax collectors were not quite as revered as the IRS is, if you follow that, um, of our nation. But they were known for stealing and being heavy handed and for taking from the poor only to increase the earnings and the possessions of the wealthy. And so while being a tax collector in Matthew's day would have been seen as what you might call a comfortable government job, it was a job that brought with it a lot of despise from the people and one of the few governmental officials that the church of that time despised and literally looked down upon, frowned upon, and even probably borderline hated. Because quite often, tax collectors would again take from the poor unnecessarily and heavy-handedly and give it to the rich so that the rich kept getting richer and the poor kept getting poorer. Does that sound familiar? We won't talk about that. <laughs> All right. Yet, in spite of his career as a tax collector, in spite of his wickedness, in spite of his ways that were displeasing, not only to God, but to 
people of every walk of life in his day and time, regardless of whether they were religious people, Jewish, non-Jewish, everybody hated the tax collectors. Yet one day, God saw something in him and Jesus calls Matthew into ministry. And that's really interesting to me because it is a reminder that no matter where we are, where we come from, whether we are in the street, whether a person is a drug dealer, a prostitute in a gang, or even white collar crime, when God sees something in you, Jesus can call you out of that and into a place of ministry and servitude and cause you to make a difference in the world. Is that your testimony? He can take you from wherever you are and make of you whatever it is that he wants you to be. And that's the marvelous story that we get from the ministry of Matthew. So we find this calling in Matthew chapter 9, verse number 9. And by the way, don't forget to check the link in the description or go to the church website to get the free handout that goes along with each and every Bible study. Now, there are included on the handout full notes as well as discovery questions that will help you take a deeper dive into the scripture and get a little bit more into the story than you can just by watching. So Matthew 9 and 9 says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. And watch what Jesus says. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. Oh man, I just love this. I love this because of the vivid imagery that we have. Jesus sees him in his official role as tax collector. And he does not wait until Matthew goes to lunch at the tavern or the restaurant around the corner. He doesn't wait until he catches Matthew, you know, in an alley or while he is going from office to office, but he calls Matthew where he sees Matthew. And from that very place of the tax collector's booth, please get this, because this is the place where he was ripping people off. But Jesus calls him from that very spot and notice what he says to him. Follow me. Two simple words. No long dialogue, no long speech, no long promises. Just two words. Follow me. And, and the, the, the miracle and the magic, if you will, in this is without delay, without hesitation, without dialogue, without a promise of a future because he was living well, living large, living off the backs of people. But when he heard and saw the Savior with two words, follow me, Matthew, the Bible says, got up and followed him. And this immediate response to Jesus's call, it really shows a heart that was ready for change. You know, which reminds me that a person can have all the riches and the wealth in the world. They can have all the resources in the world. But until you have the source, you will not really be happy with a resource. And when Matthew saw Jesus, he knew this is the peace and the joy, the happiness, the connection, the relationship. This is the future that I've been waiting for. I've been looking for this is what I've been wanting that money cannot buy. There was a satisfaction in simply being with Jesus, following Jesus, that nothing else could provide. That's why Matthew dropped everything and got up and immediately followed Jesus. And it really reflects the heart of Matthew that he was ready for a change. You know what? I have learned is that people won't change until they're ready for a change. But here's the other great part of that is this, that God can so arrange a person's life that they can have access to money, to resources, to wealth, to whatever creature conference that you want to call. But God can so fix it that he can work in a person's heart until the point that they realize I've got all of this but there's still something missing.
I suspect, family, that that's what happened with Matthew, that Matthew could look around him, maybe at the rings on his finger, maybe at the upgraded uh, home that he had and all of the fixtures and all that went into everything that made him who he was up to that point. And yet, he lacked the satisfaction. But when he sees Jesus, when he sees Jesus, when he sees Jesus and hears Jesus calling him, he was ready for that change. I want to stop here for a moment and just encourage you. You may have some loved ones who are sort of like Matthew before Jesus, Matthew BC before Christ, that um, may have access to a lot of things, but you're still praying for their soul that they might find Jesus. Well, listen, let this be hope and encouragement for you to know that no matter where a person is in life, Jesus can still see them. Jesus can still call them. Jesus can still change them. Do you believe that? I absolutely believe that. And I know that he has a way of mending their heart and so they can find him as the satisfaction for their soul. Now, we've talked a lot about the family members of the other disciples, but when it comes to Matthew, there's not a lot to be disclosed there. So we're not quite sure of Matthew's genealogy and all of that, but he is an expert at the genealogy of Christ when you read Matthew chapter number one. So there are some very key and critical moments in the life of Matthew as he walked with Christ. Let's look at a few of those and don't forget to get the handout. So the first key moment that I wanna talk about in Matthew's life is that Matthew hosted Jesus at his home. And you can find that in Matthew chapter nine and verse number 10. And I want you to think about the, the significance of this because Matthew being a Jewish tax collector, a public figure, employed by the Roman government, a governmental employee with a cushy job. Who are his friends? Tax collectors and people of status. Yet Matthew decided that his home wouldn't be complete except he invited Jesus into it. And let me just tell you that no matter who you know, what you have, how big you live, how big your bank account, portfolio, IRA, stocks, bonds, etc. It doesn't matter who you know if you don't know Jesus. And every person needs to host Jesus in their home. Not just host him one time, but make sure he's living there. Make sure he is abiding and dwelling in your home, in your children's lives, in your grandchildren's lives. And Matthew saw fit to host Jesus at his home. Here's a second one. Matthew was also experiencing a key moment in his life in that he was one of the 12 disciples who was chosen by Jesus. And you can find that in Matthew chapter 10, verse number three. What I love about that is that Jesus does not hold against us our background or even our habits or even our hangups or even what we have done up to that point in our lives. Because think about it. Matthew was an expert at stealing and conniving and using people and manipulating systems. But yet Jesus has a way of calling you and choosing you in spite of what you've done wrong. And you know what else? He can also take your skills and turn it around and use it for the kingdom of God. Some of the best soul winners are redeemed drug dealers because they're accustomed to selling something to a mass audience. But when Jesus gets a grip on their heart, he can even use that skill to cause them to now no longer sell dope, but to sell hope. I use the word sell, but to give hope instead of dope. And Matthew is a testament to the fact that Jesus can still call you even when you jacked up. Boy, great news that is. 
There's a third key element I want to talk about in Matthew's life, and that is writing the gospel of Matthew. Matthew is that gospel that provides a great detail of Jesus's life and his teachings. You know, as I think about this third key element in Matthew's life, we ought to all be a repository of the life of Jesus. Our lives ought to be living letters that exemplify and that magnify what Christ has done. And that's what Matthew did in the writing of the Gospel of Matthew. But I want to challenge you to pick up the pen of your life and let your life be a living tribute to a living Lord so that others may know about Jesus Christ. And that's a powerful key in the life of Matthew. Watch this, because remember I told you that the Lord can take the skills that you use in the world and turn them around and use them in the kingdom? Well, think about this. Think about this. Of all the disciples to write and to keep an accurate record of Christ's deeds and doing and his life, who better than a tax collector who was constantly writing, constantly uh, keeping track of who paid, who didn't pay, of what something was worth and what he sold it for on the black market. <laughs> the Lord can use your negative habits and turn them into a positive for the kingdom. That is just so powerful. So there are several lessons that we learn from the life of Matthew. And again, I want to remind you, just in case you just tuned in, make sure that you get the PDF handout that goes along with this teaching so that you can see the entirety of the teaching along with personal discovery questions to help you dive deeper. So let's look at some of the lessons that we learn from the life of Matthew. Number one, embrace change willingly. Embrace change willingly willingly. Remember, when Jesus meets Matthew in chapter 9, verse 9, he says two words, follow me. And without a long dialogue, discussion, without a contract, oh, wow, think about that. Matthew is accustomed to being a man of writing, but there's nothing in writing at the time. There's no guarantee on this. But hearing the Savior's call, he was willing to embrace change willingly and quickly respond and move in the direction of Jesus Christ. You and I have got to learn to embrace change willingly. One of the worst words that you can ever say in a church is change. But friends, if we're gonna really follow Christ, if we're really gonna be effective in this life, we've got to be flexible enough to go with Christ whatever direction he leads. So embrace change willingly. Here's the second lesson we learn from the life of Matthew. Lead with inclusivity. Now, what do I mean here? Remember that Matthew hosts Jesus at a party with some of his now former and perhaps current colleagues. He included sinners in the midst of the Savior. You know, we're often taught in churches that we should avoid being around sinners, that we should only associate with people who go to church, go to Sunday school, and that kind of thing. I just have one question about that. How can you be the light of the world if you always remain in sunny places? You see, our job is to take what we have experienced with Christ into a dark place and win them to Christ. So amongst your people that you associate with, there should be some who need light along with those who have light. And so inclusivity is something that Matthew practiced in his life in that he didn't just associate it with believers or Christians, but he also brought other unbelievers into the fold by introducing them to Jesus. So your light has to shine brightly 
for Jesus in a dark world. I think that's why the Lord puts us in some of the circumstances, some of the jobs, or maybe with some of the coworkers that we work with, or some of the, the people on our street, in our neighborhood, in our community. I believe God strategically puts us there so we can be inclusive in the networking of our lives and share Jesus and the love of God with all people. I believe that's our purpose. So even in his leadership, he emulated inclusivity. He emulated inclusivity. And it makes sense to me because Matthew as a tax collector was dealing with all types of people, the poor, the wealthy, the rich, the middle class, the upper class, the upper echelon, and those who were just barely getting by. And so as leaders, whether you're talking about at work or in church or in some type of ministry format, we must learn to deal with all types of people and be inclusive, particularly in the ministry of the church. Because the church is not about the haves and the have-nots. It's about the love of Christ being shown to all people, all people being equal, and everyone being a child of God. And that's the inclusivity that I'm talking about. I know that there's a lot of chatter about that word these days, but that's the kind of inclusivity that Matthew showed, that Jesus showed. And that's the kind of inclusivity that I am sharing with you in this teaching. Here's the third lesson that we learn from the life of Matthew, and that is that redemption can come through new beginnings. You can find redemption in new beginnings. When Jesus calls him, it was a new beginning. It was a new relationship that was formed. And it was new redemption. Redemption means that you are bought with a price. You're bought back. You're purchased by God. And Jesus, on his way to Calvary, stopped long enough to take on a sinner that was a white-collar criminal, Matthew, the tax collector. And in that connection, Matthew finds redemption and he finds a brand new beginning. And I want to leave you with this takeaway because you might have, again, someone you're praying for, you believe in God to change or to help or to strengthen or what have you. It might even be you. It might even be your spouse. But I want you to remember this this week. Redemption is always possible. Always. Redemption is always possible. And there's never a time that redemption is not possible as long as there's life and as long as there's breath in a person's body. So I want you to understand some points that we must ponder from the life of Matthew. Number one, assess your readiness to follow Christ. Are you ready to take him by the hand? Are you ready to follow Christ? Are you ready to grab his hand and say, I'll follow you wherever you go? Evaluate your circle of influence. Just like Matthew hosts Jesus and his friends or former friends or co-workers, maybe even associates that he held on to. Evaluate your circle of influence. Who is it that you could influence for Christ? And then number three, contemplate your role in God's story. What is it that he wants you to do? Who is it he wants you to reach? How is it that God wants you to use your skills for the kingdom of God? I'm talking about those BC skills, before Christ skills. You know what I'm talking about. How does he want you to use that for the glory of God? So think about that. How can you use your unique background and your talents to contribute to God's kingdom, just like Matthew used his writing to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let Matthew's story inspire you to follow Jesus with an open heart. Lead with love. Embrace the redemption that comes from a life that is dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you got something out of this teaching. I have enjoyed sharing this with you. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to check the link or go to the church website to grab that free PDF handout, share it with someone, along with the link to this session 
session number seven. Hey, can't wait to share with you in part eight. Until next time, this is Bishop Littman saying you go with God.